Hello again. It'd be great if you had the Bibles you brought with you open. We are a church, I hope, that does bring our Bibles. And if you need one, if you need a Bible online or if you need a Bible here in the room, let us know because I would love to see that what you're doing as myself or anyone else is up here is that you have it open in front of you. You're checking what we're saying. You're listening to ultimately what God's saying. I'm going to be a little bit provocative today uh, as, a, as a, a slight warning because I do believe that Paul is being that in his tone. And if you have questions at the end of this sermon, uh, if you want to chat about any of what I have to say, come chat to me. I, I think it's important we do this as a community, right? And in fact, that's what this piece of God's Word really pushes us towards. So I'm going to pray that God might speak powerfully to us today through His Word. So would you at home pray with me? Would you here in the room pray with me? Let's pray. Father God, Thank you for the cross of Christ. Thank you that in the cross we can see the wonderful message that gives us a hope of salvation. Lord, please help us to be a people who keep the cross at the centre. Please help us to be a people who for that reason are then united together in Christ Jesus our Lord. Help us now to hear what you have to say to us from your word, even if it is a little bit confronting at times, even if it does force us to really wrestle with our culture and what really lies deep within our desires and our wants and our hopes and our dreams. Help us to bring all of this to you, knowing the wonderful saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've ever seen, and I've got a photo up that will hopefully come up here, a cross-section of an iceberg What lies beneath tends to be bigger, right? The Titanic discovered that, didn't it? When the top, they saw the iceberg, but it was actually what lay beneath that caused the big damage to its hull. It's often the case with a lot of issues that we have that what's on the surface doesn't really get to the actual deeper, bigger issue, that what lies beneath is the bigger part of the issue. Like an infection, you might have some signs and some symptoms on the top, but you don't really know what it is until you start to investigate and search and discover what is sitting behind this. Or if you want to get building mentality into that sort of territory, what are the foundations, the footings? When you see cracks in a building, you have to ask, does it start from something deeper, from what lies beneath? Cracks were showing in the Corinthian church and Paul finds out about them. An ice, an iceberg is sort of floating bunch of them, actually, seem to be floating around in this church, and there's a risk as a result of that. The cracks are showing, the infection is there, but what is it that actually lies underneath it? What is sitting below these signs and symptoms? What is the issue that lies beneath? Because Corinth is in dispute. They're in division. And after what we saw last week, you'd think they're an amazing church based upon the neon light. If you only read up to verse 9, you'd think, wow, the way that he addresses them. And they are an amazing church because of what church means. They're in Christ Jesus. But they're having issues. And there's nothing wrong with disputes, is there? There's nothing wrong with having some disagreement. In fact, unity can be the result of that. Conflict can actually bring about a greater resolute decision that you hold on together. But when division arises and you start to see big cuts in your hull, it starts to get a bit precarious. Division begins to form. Disunity is the issue that arises there too. And for Paul, that's not only devastating in the church, it's it's dire. And it requires, from his perspective, a, a response, an appeal. And so that's what he does in these next few verses. In a way, we actually have like intro take two, because this little part that we look at today is an intro to the next four chapters. As he starts to appeal with his brothers and sisters, appeal with those that he loves deeply to be united. He's just shone this beautiful neon light in the you know, intro take one. And now he says, okay, let's get to the issue. Let's start to address the stuff that needs to be fixed in this church so that we can keep becoming what we have been made to become, the church of God in Corinth, in Christ, in community, in common unity, because it's a mess. And so in verse 10, Paul begins with an appeal. And that's what we're going to look at to begin with, the appeal. What is the appeal that he is making? Have a look with me at verse 10 as we check out his appeal. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, no schisms, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought, that you have the same mind, the same purpose. Why is he appealing to them like this? Well, because he needs to fix the issues that are within. And that's the next four chapters that he does. But what did he say back in verse 9? Just scan your eyes back. They've been called into the fellowship with Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, if you're in fellowship with Christ, you're meant to then be, as people in Christ, united with each other. Today, I want us to search below the surface a little bit, or to begin with, identify the things that are just sitting there at the top. Because the issue for the Corinthians, and I tapped into it a little bit last week, is that they've got autonomy issues, authority issues, and they're arrogant, as arrogant can be. Because of radical individualism expressed in their consumerism, they are kind of being anti anybody else being the authority but themselves. They're boasting. And does that sound familiar to a culture that we may function in as well? Radical individualism, consumerism, anti-authoritarianism, if it's somebody else other than myself. And it creates divisions. This is the issue. And the solution I'm only going to touch on today, but I also want us to really think, what is the thing sitting underneath all of this? Because there are similar risks in any church to hitting that iceberg, to seeing things tear apart, to seeing divisions happen, to seeing the, the instability of the church continue to rock, and so it all starts to crack. Their culture and our culture are actually very, very similar. But I wanted to start by encouraging you. I think we as a church have done pretty well with this over the years, from what I've heard. And I'm encouraged to be a part of a community that wants to figure this thing out together. There's a bunch of different people here and it's great. But I also want to encourage you to allow today to search you. I said I'm going to be a little bit provocative, but please hear me right. I'm not trying to attack you. I'm not trying to attack the church. I love the church. It's Christ's church. But I want us to really search and then search deeper. Because I believe that's what God's word is trying to do to us. The steak was served last week, right? This big, juicy steak or that delicious vegan mushroom. And now, Paul starts to cut it up into bite-sized pieces so that these guys can consume it. And he says, I appeal to you, be perfectly united in mind and thought. Brothers and sisters, he calls them, right? There is affection in this. Don't think he's coming and swinging a hammer. He's coming to say, I love you. You need to hear this. He's then including himself in that, like he's a sibling, as well as their father you'll hear later. And he appeals. He doesn't demand. He doesn't either or avoid it. He says, hey, these are issues we need to deal with and I'm coming to you this way. And how does he do it? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Collective. He's a part of all of this, right? The one that you've been called into fellowship with as well. His name, not my name, not the church's. This is his church. All of you, he says, speak the same. Have a unified voice. All of you, don't be divided because when you split and fracture, torn, and you're not going to function well, you're not going to do the job you've been called to do. Be of same mind, of same purpose. Be united. What he's saying is, I want you to be that choir that is singing perfectly in key, in harmony, in all the different... Have you ever heard a choir just singing in absolute perfection? It's an incredible thing, isn't it? I often hear it when I go to the Wanderers. <laughs> so the Wanderers, for those in the room and those playing at home that don't know who they are, they are the best football team in Sydney. Uh, the, the football is in soccer. And yep, there you can see on your screen and up on our screen here, that's the faithful RBB, the red and black block that sings. And when you go to, a, to well, back in the day when it was at Pertec, and you heard them singing in unison, it was an incredible thing. And they used to do this thing where they'd point to one side of the stadium and they'd shout... Who do you sing for? And the stadium would shout back, we sing for wanderers. And when it was united, the voice was amazing. Not quite as good as a choir, I'll I'll admit. But it was this beautiful thing. But then the problem is, there's this other Sydney team. Isn't there, Chris? They go by the name of Sydney FC. And when you go to the derby, which is the local contest between those two, this happens. You have on one side... The Wanderers singing their songs beautifully. And on the other side, this riffraff from east, the eastern suburbs mainly, singing, yeah, no division here, right? Singing their, you know the problem? I actually really like the songs that Sydney FC sings because they've got this English style to them, but let's not go there. Singing terribly, all right? And I remember being at one of the games where I, 
at points couldn't hear either voice. I didn't know what, it was so loud and there was so much going on. That's the issue in Corinth at the moment. It's a choir that is sounding more like a bunch of cats, like Sydney FC, that's wanting to tear each other apart than it is this beautiful unified voice. It is meant to not, it's not meant to be like Derby Day. It's meant to be like that time where the whole crowd is filled, red and black together, same mind, same purpose, one voice. Paul is appealing to the church in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's saying, be perfectly united. You need to restore this. It's almost like saying, there's no more Western Sydney Wanderers. There is no more Sydney FC. There is just Sydney, right? Think about how difficult that might be when people have these incredible allegiances that they've also formed on individualistic plans and purposes. Sadly, the picture that 1 Corinthians presents to us is a pretty fair picture of the church all the time, isn't it? Unity. It's a hard thing to figure out. And it's a fairly loose word, isn't it? So to begin with, just very quickly, what is unity? That phrase at the end where it says perfectly united in mind and thoughts, really helpful, because it actually means that what he says is same mind, same purpose. Have your mind so set on Christ and the things of Christ that together that's what you guys are on about. And you will dispute at times, but you will always return to that. But let me just very quickly, because I think it's helpful for us in this context, um, explain what uni- unity isn't. It isn't uniformity. It's not at the end of this, you're going to walk outside, grab your track suits, and we're all going to dress exactly the same, speak exactly the same, have these wonderful haircuts that we've all needed in this period of time and look, speak. And that's not what it's meaning by being unified in voice. If you look back in verses 5 and 6 of the beautiful neon sign intro, he talks about how they've been enriched in every way. They don't lack any spiritual gift. And if you go to chapter 12, the church has all these wonderful gifts that everybody can express in different ways. And they're one body, it says, from the little toe all the way up to the ear, the neck, the arms, everything in between. We are different, Right? but all part of this one body, all unified. Not uniformity in that we have to function exactly the same. But then secondly, unity isn't a tepid tolerance. All right, And I think this is probably something that we'll have to wrestle with in the coming years. It's not, it's not our modern view of what tolerance is. Where tolerance, I'll accept you and you do you as however you want, at the expense of truth, that that can reign. No. Dispute is actually quite important in a church, just like it is in any relationship where you want unity. It helps us to express our differences and then get to the point where we can say, all right, I disagree with you there and there, but man, we are on about this. And if we are on about that, the fact that we have the differences, that we're not, that's when we can tolerate those things because we are united in what really matters. Same mind, same purpose. What is unity? It's an essential element for the church, isn't it? And it's not just for Paul. You've got a Bible sitting in front of you. Flick to, to John, which we to the left, to the left. Flick to John chapter 17. Jesus prayed for this the night before he gets arrested, gets hung on a cross and dies. It was very key to him. What does he say in John 17 verse 20? My prayer is not for them alone. He's speaking of his disciples who are there present with him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Who's that? You, you, me, that all of them may be divided into various factions and have all these... Di- no, be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. One. Why? Verse 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It's an essential element of what it means to be a Christian, right? He wants us singing in beautiful harmony. He wants us to be the family that, yes, might wrestle through deep disputes, but then is united. He wants us not to be a city divided around two different colours. He wants us united. And so what is the issue that's sitting on the surface? So that's his appeal. The issue of autonomy, of authority and arrogance How does that look for them? And then what could that look like for us? Because I think we need to identify the issue, the symptom, to then get to the deeper issue that he unpacks. 
Because what is the issue on the surface? Let's have a look. Back in 1 Corinthians, the issue on the surface, how did Paul know? Well, firstly, yeah, how did he know? How did he find out about this? Verse 11, we hear that Chloe, somebody, some from Chloe's household have come. We're not really sure exactly who Chloe is. That he names her means she's probably known to the Corinthian church, that they would be aware of who she is. She either lives in Corinth or Ephesus, where Paul is when he writes this. And she'd be a businesswoman, it seems, because she's got this, this crew that can go and share this stuff. Ultimately, she's trusted by Paul, right? Paul trusts her, and so he's able to then take what it is that she has to say and apply it to his people. She may or may not even be Christian, but he trusts her. So what's the issue? Verse 12, what did he say? What I mean, the fact that you guys have quarrels, that there's divisions among you, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. It's clear, isn't it? The issue on the surface is a quarrelling church, a divided church, individuals who are following in their own sort of way and their own leader. I, I, I. It is significant. It's even clearer in the Greek and the way that it presents it. I. There are factions being formed. And here he addresses the whole church, right? But it doesn't seem that he's trying to tease out the parties and how they're all functioning yet. He's just saying, this ain't right, this ain't good. We're going to have to address this. He identifies the individuals so that every single person needs to look at themselves. And it seems that the cultural view of power and prominence has had its pull back on this church. Remember, we started unpacking that last week, the way that Corinth is this incredible city. And it is tearing the church apart because people want autonomy. They want authority. They want and have that arrogant spirit. Autonomy, I. There are radical individuals within this, and it's shown very, very clear here. Authority, they seem very much willing only to, only to submit to someone who matches with the things that they're desiring and wanting. That's why I said it's, it's anti-other authoritarian. It's not that they don't want an authority, they just want it to be them and have it come back to how it is that they are going to, able, going to be able to function. And then finally, arrogance. This is attached to the powerful or the way that they seem to get power, the way they can consume it and commodify it. And wisdom is going to be key as we tease out the next few weeks. There seems to be this issue around Sophia, wisdom. And attached to that are the spiritual gifts that they're meant to have been given, but they seem to be able to pursue and have and are attaching to particular leaders as well. So individuals who follow those leaders might be like, hey, we're together. There's an identification that gives them this arrogant attitude. They're approaching the church like the culture approached the allegiances that they have around them. And that meant that they were willing to say, I'll follow this one and I followed that one. And that was creating division amongst them. This is radical individualism expressed in consumerism, as I've been saying. You sum it up, it's human boasting, right? There is a problem. And the problem, yes, we'll tease out is something that's underneath. But to help us diagnose the symptoms, why was this arising in the church? It's, it's helpful to think about this, this idea of Sophia and these, these people called sophists. Because in the Greco-Roman world, in this place in Corinth, there were these people who would go around and kind of be these professional speakers and thinkers. They had this mix of philosophy and rhetoric and they were like smooth talkers that could be eloquent in what they said and powerful. Have a look at verse 17. That's why Paul sort of addresses that specific thing, not with eloquence, yeah? Not with that sort of wisdom because he's saying, that's not how I did it. These guys do it that way. They would travel around and large crowds would come and gather and people would come and they would listen to these people. They would spout their wisdom. They were flashy and if they could, they would have smoke. Like they didn't, but they could really put on a show. They entertained, but they also educated and they also influenced. Today, we have a thing called influencers. Some of us might not know what an influencer is, but there's this thing called Instagram where people jump on there and with their, with their flashy ways of doing things and they get a little bit of a platform, they're able to influence culture and influence people. And we've all had people who are influencers. Our movies, our TV shows, our radio shows, the people that we listen to who seem to spout things that make sort of sense to us, that tickle our ears and encourage us to think particular ways are our influencers. The sophists were just like that in this context. The Corinthians have been sucked back into it. Or really, it's just them jumping back and driving on the right side of the road again. Yeah? They've gone from having to try to figure out how to drive a manual to an automatic, and they are at this point again slamming on the brakes. I follow Paul. 
I follow Apollos, Apollos who came after Paul in Acts 18. He seemed to be eloquent. He also seems to be one who loved the Lord Jesus very, very deeply. And then Cephas, so Peter, the Apostle Peter, it seems, is being referred to there. Maybe he came and some thought, well, I want, I want to follow him. He seems to offer something good. And then Christ, maybe they're the originals. They were anti-law or thought that it was just, well, Paul's even presenting the right way here. We don't know exactly how these things play out. But what we do know is that the Corinthians seem to be a celebrity-obsessed, personality and performance-based, consumeristic culture. Does that sound familiar to the Western culture that, that we live in? Of course it does. And we would be fools to think that that doesn't bleed into our church. There are icebergs bobbing around, right? And I want to just tap into two expressions of this and try and force us to search, okay? One, identification with and idolization of leaders. And then two, the commodification and so consumerism of church. So let's start with one, identification and idolization of leaders. We've seen this happen generally globally, haven't we? And in recent times, we've seen the devastating effects it can have. I'm not naming these people to drag them over the coals, but to remind us of what it means when we put people up on a pedestal as leaders and how that can impact their ministry. People like Bill Hybels, people like Ravi Zacharias or Carl Lentz, these people who have failed because they're human, but because they were idolised, because people identified with them and then in a way gained power for themselves... It had devastating effects, didn't it? There's, in fact, a recent podcast that's been quite popular in, like, trying to tease this stuff out and wrestle with it called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Um, Who killed Mars Hill? You may not know about Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll, but what it's been helping me see is the way that the identification with and idolisation of leaders is something that, well, the church has to deal with. Because there is a devastating impact when we idolise human leaders, isn't there? Leaders fail. I will fail in this church. I will let you down without even wanting to, without even meaning to. I'm hoping I don't fail in an extreme fashion. We pray and hope for that. But we are not saviours. We can't do it. Leaders are limited. And if we put leaders in that position, it empties the Christian, the Christian message of its power. It empties the cross of its power and it's going to have devastating effects. We'll have a look at that in a moment. And so leaders... Yes, we need to be responsible. I don't just mean pastors. I mean any leader within the church. But sometimes it is out of our, it is out of their power too. And that seems to be the case in Corinth. So we have to ask the question, why is it that the church loves to have a leader that can be up the front and the one that we can champion and say, hey, look, I follow or I go to that church. Remember we were talking about that last week? Why? The church itself needs to take some responsibility, doesn't it? We, we, brothers and sisters, need to realise we kind of like it when that's happening because we are attached to it. And in a radical individualistic culture, identification and idolisation happens everywhere. I follow this or that. My church. And men, I, we have to be careful here as well. With any of our current, future, or even past leaders. Here's the part that I'm nervous about. (laughs) There's one pastor that's still on our pastoral team who is an incredible leader in this church. And I'm incredibly thankful that Vivian Grice is still part of this church and is leading here. (laughs) He's right behind the camera too, literally right there, isn't he? I love him very much and he's, he has been and continues to be a wonderful pastor. Some of you may not even know who I'm talking about and that's okay too, but many of you do. And there may be an attitude within this church, and I'm not saying it is the attitude, but we've got to be careful, that when Viv was leading this church, that was the glory days of Menai Baptist Church. That is an unhelpful attitude, right? Because one, it identifies, well, idolises Viv and two, It creates potentially an identification that those people that were there as part of that, that's what they hold to. And in a way, you then start to hope that that might happen again. That's not the way that our Lord works, is it? And it's so easy for us to then look back and want to include ourselves. It's so easy to long, and it's okay to long for some of the elements of what were happening there. But as soon as we attach that to Viv, a human leader, we are starting to get into some irky spots. 
the past, the present, and any future has to be about Christ Jesus. Leaders, we need to take responsibility. And yeah, of course, you want to honour your leaders. You want to respect your leaders and thank God for the way that they've led. But they are not the ones that make the church grow. They are not the ones that continue to draw people into the kingdom. That is only done through Christ crucified. Church, please keep the main thing the main thing. There's been five lead pastors of this church. David Nicholas, Vivian Grice, Heath Smith, Neil Dawson and Brett Hookham. I don't know how many more there'll be until the Lord Jesus returns or this church, whatever happens for this church. Not one of those is the reason this church is what it is. This church is what it is because of who this church is founded in and that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm thankful for every single leader that God has used in this church, particularly the pastoral leaders as they've guided and done this. But it is easy to start to tear down if we start comparing, right? Right? The measure of success for a church is is how that church is becoming what it was called to become. How they're maintaining the mission, meeting together through the ups and the downs, having the same mind, having the same purpose, and we will be fools to think that this doesn't bleed. I don't think that's a big attitude in our church. I genuinely don't. I'm not trying to... I'm just minding to make sure that we wrestle with this stuff because any time it presents in Scripture, we want to warn ourselves that we are just as prone to it. Because it can be subtle. The iceberg at the top can seem maybe small, but underneath that, we're going to have to look. Because it can cause divisions, factions, disappointments and frustrations. And that's usually attached to our mind and our purposes, not the same mind and purpose that comes from Christ Jesus. All right, that's that one done. I'm glad that's over. Number two, commodification and consumerism. Let's, let's, let's have a think about this. What does it mean to go church shopping? You ever thought about that? And I get it. I understand why we use that language because, and it probably comes from the idea of not even buying anything, but window shopping or looking around. But just, just for a second, sit in that language to shop for a church. What are you going to go do? Go buy a bunch of people? Because at the end of the day, this idea of church shopping really taps into how it is that the church has been commodified and there's been a market created. It is very easy to begin to assess church like you're going to a restaurant or going to a film, or a television program, or a musical, or a performance, right? Particularly with the way that we often do a one element of church. You go to the restaurant and you think, well, who's the chef this week? And what's on the menu? How is the service and the seating and the lighting and the noise and all those things, which of course are going to be important for our service as we gather together, I get it. But just think about how this starts to filter. Or a movie. Did you like how... It, it toyed with you, and, and did, it, did you personally enjoy that moment? Corinth had fallen into some of this too. The church, what it offered had become a commodity. And with commodities, what happens? You create a market. And then a market creates inequalities, rivalries, divisions. We live in such a consumeristic culture that there are markets everywhere, aren't there? We are just infested with this idea that a commodity is something that we then get to choose and consume And again, on a positive note, I'm not trying to be like, be the good cop, bad cop, not at all. I genuinely mean this. I don't see that that present in our church. And yet every single human heart has a tendency towards this because it requires us to put ourself aside if we're going to do church well and not the consumer commodified way of being. I have seen us be united. I have seen us have the same purpose and same mind, but we want to keep doing it, right? Which means we're going to have to work hard at putting aside some of our differences, some personal discomforts. Even what we're doing today is a bit uncomfortable, right? At times, our personal preferences for the things that matter, our songs, our sermons, our services, they are not the point, right? A key element, but not the point. Consumeristic ways of approaching church, my church, my leader, as Paul's unpacking, the form and way I like it can start to create divides. And of course, there's needs for denominations. There's needs for different expressions. But this might also be something that's just not palatable to our radical individualistic consumeristic palates, that our taste buds have been so trained by our culture and our world that we even start to taste and experience church this way. We want to get rid of that, right? And I know I'm being a little bit provocative, but what happens when the differences grow as the mission happens? where we are united for no other reason 
but Christ and his crucifixion, where we have different races, nationalities, socioeconomic statuses coming to this room, into your homes and walking and talking with each other, where your original denomination, be it Pentecostal, be it Anglican, be it Orthodox, doesn't seem to matter anymore because you've come to see who Christ is. You want to gather with his people, no matter your age or life stage, your social status, your mental or physical capacity. Subtle doctrinal indifferences that you may have. What are we going to keep united on and what are we going to keep as a centre? Are we going to start bickering about that stuff? You can't create a product for all of that, can you? It would not be personalised enough and we don't want to do it because a church singing in harmony requires more than one voice, doesn't it? And a body needs more than a stiff neck to function. There is no such thing as fellowship on your own. See, the difficulty of having different preferences and personalities will be the very space, guys, that we get to express unity as we put ourselves aside and the other before us. And yes, battle and wrestle and argue about what needs to be centre, what needs to be true. I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters at Menai Baptist Church, be perfectly united in mind and in thought because you are the church Not this. This is an essential element. Don't get me wrong. We work hard to make this happen. There's people up the back there. Thank you again, guys, who make sure you can experience this. But we are the church as the people who have been called out from the world into Christ, sanctified God's holy people in fellowship with Christ Jesus. But these surface issues, the ones like this and the ones like the ones I've unpacked in our culture, they create a brand of Christianity that Paul is saying is immature at best, and potentially false. So let's please not get complacent or ignorant. We swim in the seas of radical individualism. We swim in this world that is consumeristic. It isn't a unifying culture, is it? And we have to be careful in this space. Surface issues like this need to be unpacked because the church of God can't be a human institution built on human power and human pride because that is actually the issue that is sitting underneath, isn't it? Now, I said I was going to be provocative, and I've been more provocative in time than I wanted to be. But the issue that lies beneath, let's have a very quick look at these last few verses, because this is kind of intro take two, and the next few weeks we will actually really look at the issue that lies beneath it and the solution to that. But what does Paul say to start to get to the real issue? He asks, well, first he asks a bunch of sort of rhetorical questions with all no answers, doesn't he? Verse 13, is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Were you baptised in the name of Paul? Christ divided, he's saying, the word is literally like the word used for, for butchering, chopping up a carcass. And he's saying, no, Christ wasn't divided, he is one. And yes, you are then drawn into that. And if you are chopping yourselves up, who are in fellowship with Christ, who says he wants you and he to be one with the Father, you're chopping the whole thing up. And was was Paul crucified for you? Did he pay the penalty for sin in his body and by his blood hung upon that cross? No. Were you baptised into his name, into his power, into belonging to him, into his ownership, and for that reason then everything that's attached to him? No. And so he goes on and says, I thank God that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptised in my name. That's the issue, right? And then he has, I love it. You can almost picture Sosthenes, who's there with him writing this thing, going, ah, Paul, um, what about Stephanus? <laughs> oh, yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. All right, we've covered that. The point he's trying to make is what? It's not about the hands of who's baptised you. It's about what you've been baptised into, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Identification with him. And whenever I get an opportunity, I want to, to offer it, I guess. The other week we saw Greg get baptised. You may be somebody who knows and loves and serves the Lord Jesus Christ and has never been baptised. Let's do it. You might have been somebody who's only recently come to faith. Baptism isn't the issue here. It's what they've identified it with. What does baptism identify with? Well, Christ Jesus having been sanctified and set apart, having died to self in and with Christ and then risen to life in in and with Christ Jesus, having come then welcomed into this fellowship of the church. And so all of us together with all the saints throughout history to boast 
in Christ as you are plunged into that water and dragged back out and give him all the praise, all the glory. Because that is the point Paul's trying to make. The thing at the centre and the issue that bubbles underneath. Right here, verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and eloquence. Here's the issue. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Why are all these surface issues of concern? Because of what bubbles beneath. It isn't about Christ. It's no longer about his cross and his power. It's no longer about having been sanctified and set apart in him, having died to self in and with Christ and then being raised to life with Christ as well. They've made it about something else. It isn't about the seemingly foolish message of the gospel, that wonderful offer of grace and peace, of sanctification and salvation. So of course they're getting divided, right? And so what is at the centre of what makes us unified? Christ. Please, let's as a church keep Christ the main thing. Have fellowship in his name, which means we will meet together despite all of our differences. Centred around the cross, which means that we will be a humble people and see that that is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. What does verse 18 say? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To help us do that, I hope today, intro take two, has helped you start to search Search out those issues at the top so that you can then investigate. Have a look at the thing that lies underneath that. Let's have our disagreements, guys. Let's have disputes, remembering who we are and who we are becoming, the church of God in Christ, not in anyone else or anything else, which means we'll be a community with common unity, same mind, the mind of Christ, same purpose, the mission of Christ. And to close... I'm just going to read to you what Paul says to another church, the church that he's in when he writes 1 Corinthians. If you want to go there, you can go to Ephesians chapter 4. But maybe instead of looking at it, why don't you just close your eyes for a moment? If you're at home, just pause. We're going to sing of the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment. But to help us to be reminded again of what our same mind and same purpose is and why it's so important, hear these words that Paul writes to the Ephesian church. He says to them, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Why? Well, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Might we be that church here at Menai Baptist, and for that reason work very hard to be that with the other churches here in 2234 and beyond, all to the glory and praise of our great God. I think this next song is a very fitting way for us to close our service together, to sing of the name of Jesus, the beautiful name, the powerful name, the only name, the one in whom we are all called and drawn together. So at home, please sing. And here, I think it is fitting for us to stand for this last one. So why don't we stand and praise the glorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ.